Good evening, I'm Brandi Bernwald, the Director of Alumni Relations at Ferris State University, and thank you for joining us for tonight's Alumni Social Hour, Black History and Civil Rights at Ferris, a discussion with Franklin Hughes. On Monday, we will observe Martin Luther King Jr. Day. MLK Day marks the birth of Martin Luther King Jr., the chief spokesperson for nonviolent activism in the civil rights movement. Tonight, we will discuss Black history and civil rights here at Ferris, and some of the very important men and women that laid the foundation and were a part of the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. We'll discuss the value of diversity and opportunity and that of Mr. Ferris's influence. The presentation will run approximately 50 minutes and at the end there will be time for questions. You may click the ask a question button near the bottom of your screen or if you're watching on Facebook Live, simply put your questions in the comment section. We will get to them as soon as we can. And now a little bit about our special guest and presenter this evening, Franklin Hughes. Franklin has been a multimedia specialist for the Diversity, Inclusion and Strategic Initiatives Office and the Jim Crow Museum at Ferris State University since 2011. He is the primary content creator of audio and video for the Jim Crow Museum, researcher, and also maintains the website. Hughes co-authored Haste to Rise, a remarkable experience of black education during Jim Crow along with Dr. David Pilgrim in 2020. Hughes earned his Master of Science in Career and Technical Education post-secondary administration from Ferris State University in 2017. And with that, I welcome Franklin to begin his presentation, Making the World Better. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you. Thank you, Alumni Association, for having me and, and everybody who is who's here. Um, Hopefully that we get something from this tonight, and it, this is a subject matter that, that um, is near and dear to my heart. It was a, a labor of love, at, as Dr. Pilgrim says, um, researching this, and so I'm, I'm excited to, to talk a little bit about this story. So let me uh, share my screen real quick and get this presentation started. So the, the, the title is Making the World Better. Um, it, that was Mr. Ferris's um, mantra and, and that he had while he was at Ferris uh, and, and his goal was to challenge the students, all the students to make the world better, find a way that they can make the world better. Um, and the Ferris Institute fostered an atmosphere for all students to be activists and to find ways to impact the world in, in the world around them and in the corner of the world, whatever um, career they took, the goal was to try to make the world better in any way you can. Um, as talked about a little bit, Already, uh, Haste to Rise is a book that Dr. Pilgrim and I wrote. And, and first of all, I want to say thank you to Dr. Pilgrim um, if he's out there, um, just how he, he allowed me to to run with this research as that we started stumbling on some things. And I'm not necessarily a historian or or a researcher or a writer at that. And but he uh, he encouraged me and allowed me to run with this and, and to go with it. And so it's been a really really interesting program or interesting. Um, uh, journey that we've, we've done. And so, again, the book is available online um, from PM Press or it's available at the Jim Crow Museum. Uh, you can get it in person if you'd like. Um, we get no, none of the royalties. They all go to the Ferris, uh, Ferris State University to the Jim Crow Museum. So uh, first off, I'd just like to talk about how um, since MLK Day is coming up, that MLK Day is, and week for that matter, has always has been a part of Ferris for approximately 35 or over 35 years. And as you can see here, there's a couple images, you know, one from uh, the late 80s uh, and one here from a few years ago. And, and you see how much it's grown. One thing that's been consistent, it's always been cold and snowy, um, but that doesn't stop people from getting out there and, and showing, celebrating Dr. King, celebrating his legacy. Um, and a lot of times it's a day on, a day of service. And, and I think that's important not to just take it as a day off, but take it as a day of service and find a way to serve your community and serve your world. Um, I want to start here with a little Ferris-ism. Uh, Mr. Ferris has a lot of, a lot of little quotes that I, that, that are they're little nuggets. Um, this is an interesting quote that Dr. Pilgrim and I found. And it says, when you see a man or a woman trying to rise and doing the right thing, don't be selfish, but try to help that person rise. Now, we discovered this quote after we had decided to name the book Haste to Rise. And so then it was kind of like providential that that is exactly what we need to name this book because it's all about helping others rise. And so in the book, if, if you haven't read it, I really encourage you to read it. I, I think it's a I think it's a good book. I mean, I'm, I'm 
kind of biased, but but you know, <laughs> I think it is. Nevertheless, um, it's kind of bookended with with two stories of murals. And and for, the first thing I want to say is it's not a critique on any of the murals on the art. The art is subjective, and, and art is beautiful, and, and there are some beautiful aspects of these art. So it's not an intimate or, or anything on the art itself, but it is a critique on on the messaging. Um, stories that we tell they matter and they matter the representation that we have, particularly if, if groups or people are omitted. Now, if people weren't a part of something, then you don't just throw them in there just to have diversity. But if people were a part of something and they're omitted, then that becomes an issue. And so here we have the one mural here with, with in the Star Building um, with Mr. Ferris, and, and, and it, and it or, 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 reports to tell the story, kind of like a brief history of, of the Ferris Institute. And you can see some things, there's a couple of racially ambiguous people there, but but it really doesn't show any impact of peoples of color in the Ferris Institute. Um, it does show some hands-on learning and it does show some technical education, which is something that Mr. Ferris did. Um, but the fact that there were, were students of color here that had an impact and then left here and had even a greater impact is a significant part of the story. Um, and the story here on the other side with, with this mural, this is in downtown Big Rapids. It's a mural that, that tells of the logging industry in, in the Big Rapids area, not just Big Rapids, but the whole the surrounding area. And one of the things that's omitted from it are people of color, are, are African-American loggers and uh, Native American loggers. Um, but I happen to know for a fact that there were African American loggers in the area at this time. Uh, my wife is a member, or is part of the old settler families from the Macosta County area, and her family members they had logging companies, they had logging camps, and you know I look at this picture with, with this with this dock. Um, there's actually a picture of of a dock with a lot of loggers that are her family on it. And they're black, and so they're part of the story. They're part of the fabric of of the area, and and it is a rich history, and 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 I think when when they're not when the history isn't represented, it, it kind of diminishes um, the history of the area, and, and it sends the wrong message. It's just not accurate. So um, it, it, there's a lot of things to be proud of with Fair State. Institute, Fair State University and its history and its founding, but also Big Rapids and this community. And hopefully we'll see some more of that as, as we go on. Um, the school Mr. Ferris started, um, it was always an opportunity for all. Um, you know, there's a quote here that was from a 1903 Ferris Institute um, catalog. And it says for the past 10 years, so that means in the 1890s, that there were um, international students here. Students from Norway, from Sweden, from Denmark, from the Netherlands, from German, from Armenia, and from Mexico, it was just to, say, to, to name a few. And so the interesting thing about that is that when these students were here, Mr. Ferris and the Institute provided um, special ESL, English as a Second Language Fluency courses, and, and the goal was to, to help them succeed. And they had some some crazy uh, thing, what is it, that within three to six months that they could get people to speak fluently and speak and write English, um, that's pretty amazing. Um, and, but nevertheless, they had a program and, and they provided the opportunity for, for people who would have not had had this opportunity anywhere else in the country. And here's just a, a few a kind of a hodgepodge of images that you can see from these are from the 19 teens to the 1920s in the yearbooks where you have, you know, students here from Armenia, from Cuba, from Syria, another one from Syria here, person from Spain, from Argentina, from Peru from Cairo, Egypt, from France, from Cuba, from the Philippines, Peru again, and Mexico. You have, again, you have representation from, from students from all over the world that were here at the Ferris Institute early on. I mean, from, from before 1900 on, these students were here and they were a part of the community. They were part of the fabric of the institution. Now, the question is, is how did, um, how did Mr. Ferris get to this point? How did he um, have the, the this this um, I guess the spirit of opportunity and 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 helping people? First thing I want to say is that um, I don't think Mr. I don't want I don't want to say Mr. Ferris is a white savior or anything like that. Uh, but what he was was a person who genuinely believed in equality and equity and opportunity for all. And how he got that way is is from his upbringing. He he grew up in an area in Spencer, New York, which um, 
was was a, a abolitionist hotbed, and he he had an opportunity to to be exposed to certain kind of thinking, a certain kind of attitudes. Um, but he was also he, he had opportunities to to I'm sorry to see people speak and present their ideas. Um, these are some of his influences. Um, right here to the far left, I'll talk about Anna Howard Shaw. Um, she has really no necessarily connection with Ferris Institute itself, but she is a big you know, person in the Big Rapids area, as she was uh, the first female minister in, in the country. Um, Mr. Ferris, when he was a senator in Washington, D.C., he had two portraits or two paintings in his office. One was Abraham Lincoln, and the other one was Anna Howard Shaw. So to him, I mean, he, he was she was a, a, a grand influence on him, and he wanted to make sure that that message of her was was given to his students. And that's the other thing he would do too. He would read excerpts and, and expose his students at the daily morning exercises to to different thoughts and idea, and challenge them with the different thoughts and ideas that they might not have had, might not have been grown up with. But he challenged them with with these ideas and these these um, equity and inclusion and civil rights ideas. The next person here, which one of his influences is Kelly Miller. Now, Kelly Miller was a Howard University professor. He was a sociologist. He was a mathematician. He was a writer. Um, he actually was one of the editors of the Crisis Magazine with uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. And so he spoke a lot about race and inequality and, and African-American issues and opportunities that, that weren't given to them. He spoke a lot about that. But Mr. Ferris also quoted from him a lot in his speak in his speeches and in his writings, um, and he would also read from his from Kelly Miller's writings to the to the student body at the morning exercises. Um, you have Frederick Douglass here. Frederick Douglass, um, everybody knows who he is, but Mr. Ferris had the opportunity to hear him speak twice. Um, when as as a young man, his his father took him to hear him speak. Um, there's a excerpt in a book in the book that we talk about that one of the um, one of the times that he went and heard Mr. Uh, Booker T. Walker, I'm sorry, Frederick Douglass speak, uh, he was, Frederick Douglass spoke about and he argued that African Americans should be treated as first class citizens, free from insult, segregation, explo exploitation, and terrorism. Douglass said that slavery was a crime against humanity, and so was Jim Crow. And so, as a young man, Mr. Ferris was was exposed to these ideas, these challenging ideas. Um, and 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 so the thing is, is what does he do about it after he hears these things? Uh, one of his other influences is is Abraham Lincoln, which Mr. Ferris considered the the, the greatest American, um, with the the way that Lincoln had to balance the the rebellion of the states and you know basically your civil war i mean it, it, it was it was a ter terrible time but he considered him a, the greatest american for the way he handled it the way he stood by his faith and by his principles um, uh, another influence down here is uh victoria woodhall uh she was the first woman to run for president uh mr ferris was admired her he went and heard her speak on a few occasions and and he spoke about her in, in a couple of his writings and again, so she, she's the first woman. Uh, this is the other thing about the First Institute. The First Institute had a lot of women or more than a few women suffrage leaders um, throughout the United States. I think we'll get a chance to hopefully talk about a couple of them here at the end. Another influence was uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. In the early 1900s, Mr. Ferris read from Du Bois' The Souls of Black Folk uh, to the student body. And, and it's interesting that you have uh, du Bois, who, who had the, the philosophy that African Americans um, should be challenged in higher education with with uh, with the sciences, with art, and with the intellectual challenging. While the the other argument, in a sense, was Booker T. Washington with his school and, and, and with the, the hands-on um, technical education, practical education, which Hampton Institute was, and even Tuskegee was. And they kind of had a Booker, or Booker T. Washington and Du Bois kind of had a little um, conflict there with, with the philosophies. But Mr. Ferris wrote about this and he spoke about this, that he was able to marry the two together of challenging his students intellectually, offering them science, offering them language, offering them the arts, but then also teaching them practical education. And you know, one of the things that Mr. Ferris says that is, is that a man who doesn't work with his hands is useless. <laughs> so, you know, so he, he saw that there was value in all of these things. And so he kind of tried to, to, to form his uh, institute in that manner that, that married these two philosophies. Uh, the last person here on the bottom right is uh, John Brown. Now, it's it's 
John Brown was a controversial figure throughout history, particularly at the time that Mr. Ferris was uh, was a um, president of this all white university um, or all white school. But he considered John Brown an American hero. And, and that's that's a bold statement to make. You know, John Brown, of course, of Harper's Ferry and State Revolt was not considered a hero by the, a lot of people in the United States. Um, but Mr. Ferris did consider him a hero because of what he did. He stood and he died for what he believed in to to free the bondage people of this country. And, you know, you talk about civil rights. He's definitely one of the civil rights, early civil rights leaders. Um, and Mr. Ferris publicly considered him a hero. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about Booker T. Washington. Uh, one of the things that, that really struck us as we did this research is, and I don't think anybody knew this before we, well, anybody alive necessarily didn't know this, that in 1902, Booker T. Washington came to the Ferris Institute and spoke on campus. Um, it was a sold out crowd, people from all over the, the Big Rapids area, uh, the, the county and different counties came to see him and uh, they supported him. and. You know, that, that's a pride point of the community to, to embrace Booker T. Washington, probably the most influential um, African-American of that time and maybe even of all time. Um, but he, he, he came here. The Alumni Association was actually what, who brought him here. The, the first Alumni Association brought him here in 1902. Um, and it's interesting that when he was here, it, it was less than 10 months after Booker T. Washington had done the unthinkable and ate at the White House. I mean, it was for, for a black man to eat at the White House was was um, a scandal. And so it was all in, in the papers and people took sides, whether or not that was appropriate or not. But there was no doubt, though, of what the Ferris Institute and what Mr. Ferris believed the side that should be taken. And the taken the side is to bring Booker T. Washington here and to treat him as a man with respect as he deserved. Um, it's also interesting that Booker T. Washington and Mr. Ferris now, I'm not going to say they were friends, but I, but they were definitely colleagues. They definitely knew each other. Um, they, they were at conf multiple conferences together as attendees, and, and they were speakers at multiple conferences together. And, and I think the way that some of the things we'll, we'll talk about later, there's definitely, you know, there was a connection that Booker T. Washington knew of Mr. Ferris and knew of his institute. Um, Mr. Ferris would read from... Booker T. Washington's works um, at morning at the morning exercises. What's interesting about this is there was um, in 1954 there was a newspaper article in the Detroit News where somebody had donated some items to to the Fair State Fair State College, and one of the items was a book that they had found, which was My Life and Work by Booker T. Washington. And in the book, it was Mr. Ferris's own personal copy, and he had annotated notes in there. Um, unfortunately, the the the, the book has been lost somehow. Um, no one knows where it's at, but it, it'd be amazing to find that one of these days. Hopefully we can stumble across it. Um, the last thing I want to say about here, Booker T. Washington and Mr. Ferris is like in, in 1916, this bottom bullet point, uh, Mr. Ferris gave a speech um, at a memorial memorial for Booker T. Washington in Detroit. Now there were memorials all over the country um, and, and they, they took almost over a year, as many memorials that they did. Um, and the speech that Mr. Ferris gave was Washington's contributions to education. Now, when the papers talked about Booker T. Washington's death, almost almost every one of them, or most of them, said, you know, the Negro educator, or the Negro uh, schoolman, or the colored educator, or the colored scholar, or the colored um, schoolman. But Mr. Ferris called him simply the Prince of American Educators. And, and that shows how he saw him. He saw him as a man. The prince of American educators, not as a colored prince, not as a Negro prince, but the prince of American educators. And he had so much respect for Booker T. Washington's work. So before we get to the Hampton uh, aspect, which we, which is, takes up most of the stuff in the Haste to Rise book, there were some African American students that uh, predated the arrival of Hampton students. Um, and I will talk a, a little bit about some of these guys. Uh, down here on the bottom left is, um, man, Middleton Pickens. I, mean, I almost forgot his name for a minute. So Middleton E. Pickens is from uh, South Carolina. He uh, came to the Ferris Institute in, um, in 1900. And to get a pharmacy degree, he had already had a, a bachelor's from Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, but he came to Ferris to get a pharmacy degree. Um, and he wasn't just here as a pharmacy student. 
uh, the Ferris Institute News had a little pharmacy column. Each each of the uh, departments had little columns, and there was a pharmacy column. Uh, well, Middleton Pickens was the writer of the pharmacy co of the pharmacy column, and he spoke of the, the the comings and goings and the antics, I guess, in the sense of the the students that were in that pharmacy department. And you could just tell by the writing that he wasn't just an African American student on campus. He was a part of the Ferris culture, a part of the institute, and and and. and it wasn't that this was just a place to go to school. It was a place that you could belong. And Middleton Pickens was that. Um, the interesting thing about him also is that after he got his pharmacy degree, he went to the Detroit College of Medicine. Now, in order to get to, into the Detroit College of Medicine at that time, you had to have a recommendation. And Mr. Ferris wrote him a recommendation. And the other thing that Mr. Ferris did is he, he provided him loan monies to go to the, to the college, Detroit College of Medicine. Uh, which would equal up to twenty thousand dollars in today's work in today's money. That's a significant amount of money that, that you invest in this young man to to go on to medical school. Now, uh, Pickens wasn't the only person that Mr. Ferris did that to. Mr. Ferris had a, a, a like a safe box where he had these receipts, these IOUs from these students that that he would provide loans to. And he wasn't necessarily a rich man, but he always bragged about how all the students would pay him back. And the student, and so he, he had no problem with leading you to give you this opportunity. Fortunately, Middleton Pickens died before he could pay it all back. He was uh, a doctor in Muskogee, Oklahoma, um, and he passed away in his early 30s before he could pay it all back. Um, but the other thing about uh, Pickens is, while he was in Detroit, he he tried to garner support for Mr. Ferris in his run for governor, and he had he he was like president of all these um, colored voting groups, and he tried to get. Uh, tell people or try to encourage people to vote for Mr. Ferris when he ran for president. Um, the next person I want to talk about here is an up and upper left corner, which is his name is Nate Harris. Um, so in 1902, and this is another of Durham's research that I don't think anybody who's alive knew about. In 1902, there was uh, the Chicago Columbian Giants was an all black baseball team out of Chicago uh, owned and, and managed by Frank Leland, who was a, um, Anyways, they came, they did a, a barnstorming tour throughout the Midwest in, in different states. And they came up to Big Rapids in 1902 to play a few series, series of games. Now, the community embraced the, this team so much that local businessmen pulled money together to secure the rights of the team to stay in Big Rapids and play the rest of the season here. And again, it's important because you know, it, again, that's the, the, a pride point for Big Rapids. I mean, you, nobody really knew before we even did this thing that there was any, you know, Negro baseball team or league teams up here in Big Rapids, but there were. And the community loved them. The community supported them. They sold out all the games. They would follow them they, wherever they go on travel, and they, they would go with them. Um, so the team was very successful, and even that year they won – the Negro League Championship of the World, and they played against uh, Rube Foster, who is uh, one of the, the Hall of Fame. Um, he, he's a Hall of Fame player now. Um, actually, I think he was the first Negro the Negro League player to be elected to the Hall of Fame. But the Big Rapids team beat his team in the the Color Championship of the World in 1902. Um, now, Nate Harris's connection to Ferris is that after the season, he stayed in Big Rapids, and he enrolled at Ferris as a student and he coached the football team and he played for the football team. And during that year in 1902, the team won uh, the Northern Michigan championship outside of the big universities. So it was basically like Alma and some like little semi-pro teams that were peppered around, around the, 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 the area. But Nate Harris was, was a, star of the team and again he coached the team and, and they won the championship and then the very next year uh, Harris again coached the, the team in 1903 um, until he was injured in, in a game where they played the University of Michigan where the University of Michigan beat them like 88 to nothing but Ferris Institute was very proud that they held the Michigan, the, the J Michigan juggernaut to under 100 points. <laughs> so I guess <laughs> I guess you, you, you get your wins when you can. So you, you count that as a win if you don't let them score 100. Um, Nate Harris, after his his time at Ferris, he went back to playing baseball and uh, was was 
a well-known baseball player in, in the quote unquote Negro leagues. And he was a very good player in, in the 1940s. There was a Chicago or no, not Chicago. It was a Pittsburgh Courier article that talked about the greatest Negro league players up until that point. And Nate Harris was listed as listed as one of the top uh, second basemen of all time in the Negro leagues. He had a, a, a career in baseball. Um, and yeah, uh, the next Two guys I want to talk about is here down here in the bottom right is uh, Chester Bush and up here is Edgar McDaniel. Um, Chester Bush and McDaniel were both here in 1903 or 1904 and 1905 to get business degrees. Um, Chester Bush, however, was the son of John Bush. John Bush is here in this upper right corner, the guy sitting right here next to Booker T. Washington. I guess that'd be on Booker T. Washington, Booker T. Washington's left-hand side is John Bush. John Bush was the the uh, founder, one of the founders of the Mosaic Templars of America, which offered insurance, mainly burial, initially burial insurance to African-Americans, and then expanded to other kinds of insurance um, to African-Americans because um, the we lived in the country that we were in, and, and if you were black, you couldn't get, get insurance necessarily. Um, but the Mosaic Templars offered that opportunity for uh, insurance to, to African Americans. And um, so in this group here, though, John Bush was a member, he was an executive committee member of Booker T. Washington's National Negro Business League. And so was Edgar McDaniel's father. He was a member of the National Negro Business League, which was actually the first business league of any color in the United States, was Booker T. Washington's National Negro Business League. So he was influential, and John Bush was one of the, at that time, one of the wealthiest men, influential African-American men in, in all of the country. Um, what's interesting is that he he could have sent his son to any number of schools, any number, given them an opportunity to study anywhere. Not, I should say anywhere, because he, he he was a black man in 1905 or 1904, 19 whatever it was. Um, but he had more opportunities than most. But he sent him to Ferris Institute to get a business degree, and uh, Chester Bush got his business degree in 18 months, and would later run run the Mosaic Templars, be the president, the the grand scribe of the. Um, the Grand Templars after his father died. Uh, another interesting thing in, in how Chester Bush was associated with civil rights, um, he was a part of a, a group, we talk about this in the book, he was a part of the, a group in 1918, a contingent that was invited to the White House that included W.B. Du Bois, Robert Van, Benjamin Davis, and, and Robert Moton, along with uh, Chester Bush and a few other uh, African-American leaders, I know I quote, quoted that, African-American leaders. Um, to, to talk about, actually to defend African-American patriotism, because the, 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 the country was thinking African-Americans wouldn't fight in Germany. Um, and so there was a quote here that we have in a book and where, where the group says that we, as African-Americans, deem it hardly necessary in view of the untarnished record of Negro Americans to reaffirm our loyalty to our country or to our readiness to make every sacrifice to win this war. We believe today that justifiable, justifiable grievances of the colored people are producing not disloyalty, but an amount of unrest and bitterness. German propaganda among us is powerless, but the apparent indifference of our own government may be dangerous. The American Negro is more than willing to share in helping win the war for democracy, but he expects his full share of the fruits thereof. So again, um, Chester Bush was an early civil rights leader. I mean, he, he, he was part of this group who who argued for the rights of African-Americans, the, the equality, the full uh, full citizenship of African-Americans in this country. Later on, uh, Chester Bush and his brother um, Aldridge Bush uh, started the NAACP chapter in Little Rock, Arkansas, and the NAACP chapter would become very influential in, in the central high school uh, integration, the Little Rock Nine. Uh, situation, uh, but it was Chester Bush and his brother who started that chapter there in Little Rock. Um, Edgar McDaniel, uh, again, his father was a part of the uh, Negro Business League. Now, McDaniel wasn't necessarily a, a civil rights leader, but he, after he got his business degree, he he got on with uh, um, Annie Malone in for for Poro College or Poro Business in Poro College, um, and that. Annie Malone's Poro actually predated Madam C.J. Walker. I mean, C.J. Walker was a was a student of Annie Malone, and, and she kind of learned some of her her um, stuff from her. Uh, Edgar McDaniel was basically the business manager of the 
of the Poro um, products and of the college. And again, he's he was a he's a Ferris alum. Well, now let's get in a little bit. So I got a little bit more time here to talk about uh, some of the, the the Hampton stories. So these guys came from. The, the bulk of the book is the story of the men coming from the Hampton Institute to the Ferris Institute and, and what they did afterwards. Um, and a lot of these guys, I want to call them uh, fathers or grandfathers of the, the 50s and 60s civil rights movement, because a lot of these men laid the foundation of the work that would be done later. And, and, and they laid the foundation in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. Uh, Gideon Smith up here to the top left is was the first student from Hampton that we know of that, that came to the Ferris Institute after Hampton. Um, he learned to play football at Ferris. Uh, he was he was definitely embraced by the, the whole college. They, they loved him. He, he, there's writings about him. The students loved him. And he was just a, he, he was just part of the part of the, the Ferris Institute. Um, after Ferris is where he learned or after Ferris, he went to the Michigan Agricultural College, which is uh, um, Michigan State University now. And he was an absolute star on the football field. I mean, he was the first African-American to play varsity sports at Michigan State. So he, he in a sense, broke the color line. Um, and he, he actually broke the color line for a lot of schools because a lot of schools that he played against wouldn't allow African-Americans. And after playing against Gideon and after he dominated so much, they had to get their own uh, – black man <laughs> to be on their team but he was a he, he was a, a, a at least a one-time all-american should have been a two-time all -American, and was probably one of the most dominant um tackles in the game at that time uh after his his time at michigan state um he played one game professional football where he played a game with uh against newt rockney but he played with john uh, Jim Thorpe was on the team. And it's interesting that, that Gideon had said later on that one of the, the greatest compliments he got in his life is Jim Thorpe said to Gideon, because Gideon didn't play till the second half, Jim Thorpe said, he said, man, if you'd have been playing the whole game, they wouldn't have paid nearly as much attention to me. So that was kind of quite a compliment that, that Gideon Gideon had. Um, so, but but what Gideon did after his time playing football is he went to back to the Hampton Institute where he became a football coach and he became a, a teacher, a ROTC teacher, a math teacher. Uh, there was an athletic director and coached the track team and, and multiple teams. But his goal was, and, and the way he could find to, to make the world better was to to give back by by building up the next generation of students, the next generation of young men and young women. And, and he did that. He was a beloved um, faculty member at Hampton Institute uh, for many years. And after he stopped uh, coaching at that time, he was the winningest coach in Hampton, uh, Hampton Institute history. Uh, the next guy here is uh, Belford Lawson, who is, uh, I would argue, is one of the most distinguished alum of, of any university that he had been to. I mean, he, he he went to Hampton Institute, he went to Ferris Institute, he went to University of Michigan, he went to Yale, and he went to Howard University. And on all these places, he should be, and he is in the most places, a distinguished alum. Uh, Belford Lawson was a civil rights attorney. He was a, and that's this is where we get to where Lawson is like a, a father or a grandfather of the civil rights movement. Uh, a couple of his biggest cases, he did argue eight cases before the Supreme Court. Um, one of his biggest ones was the New Negro Alliance, which he co-founded versus Sanitary Grocery. And the result of that case, um, it's still today, re reaffirmed and confirmed the right for people to pick it in front of a business. Um, and, 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 it, it, and if you see signs from the, the don't work, the don't, don't buy where you can't work signs where people are protesting, that was the sanitation grocery picket the don't don't buy where you can't work and that was the the case that that Belford Lawson headed up and he led that charge to to argue and win that case before the Supreme Court another case he did in 1950 was Henderson versus uh the United States which um which was a, a interstate travel rail cars and um the segregated meal meal cars on on the cars um on the rail yeah, the meal sections, whatever, they were segregated. And so um, Belford Lawson was a lead attorney uh, in, in, in that case as well. And he actually won that case. Um, he was the initial attorney in Murray versus Maryland. And so Murray versus Maryland is an interesting case because it was, uh, it's basically the precursor or one of the foundational cases for Brown versus the Board of Education. Um, and Belford Lawson was the initial attorney. Well, Belford Lawson's um, 
mentor was Charles Houston at Howard University, who was the dean of the College of Law. And one of his other, Houston's other mentees was Thurgood Marshall. Now, Thurgood Marshall had assisted Belford Lawson in a couple previous cases, but uh, Houston believed that uh, Thurgood Marshall could argue this case um, that's not necessarily better, but he was the, the, the better fit to argue the case um, because uh, Thurgood Marshall himself was denied entrance into the University of Maryland. And so anyways, Thurgood Marshall ended up uh, arguing it, winning it, and that's kind of what what catapulted his career, um, but that case was was very significant in Brown versus Board of Board of Education. Uh, Bell Fawson uh, later again was an attorney, but later on he and his wife they were uh, advisors to Senator Kennedy's uh, Senate campaign, and then his wife Marjorie was an advisor for Kennedy's uh, presidential campaign. And it's it's said that if it wasn't for Belford Lawson and his wife Marjorie, that African Americans would not have voted for John F. Kennedy. But it was because of Lawson's introducing Kennedy to to African American groups throughout the country. Um, Belford Lawson was an alpha. Uh, he was he's actually considered uh, Mr. Alpha. I mean, he, he he's one of the one of the top dogs. Uh, he, but he introduced Kennedy, uh, Bobby Kennedy, and John Kennedy to to African American groups throughout the country to get that to get their voice heard and to have the ear of Kennedys to let them know for cases and, and things that were relevant to African Americans that they needed to act on. So he was definitely a civil rights giant. Uh, the next person here is Percy Fitzgerald. Uh, Percy Fitzgerald, uh, prior to going to Ferris, um, he was a Harlem Hellfighter, uh, which in World War I, the Harlem Hellfighters were, were one of the most ferocious units uh, in the war. They, they, had, they had the most combat of all Allied forces, um, and he was a part of that group. Uh, after the war, they, they were celebrated by the French. Now, they were attached to French units because the American soldiers would not uh, um, be with them or would not let them be attached to them. So the units was the units was attached to French units, and the French units gave them uh, awards of valor or whatever. There's like this certain French award I can't remember what it's called, but they give it to the Hell Hellfighters. Uh, Fitzgerald is then mainly known after that as being um, one of the first African Americans to get an advanced degree in dentistry at, at Northwestern University. Northwestern University, and he would later go to uh, Howard University and become a, a teaching faculty of dentistry. With the guy to his left and to the right over here, top is uh, Russell Dixon. Now, Russell Dixon was also a dentist, and he was the dean of dentistry at Howard University for 35 years, where he trained and for that college trained more than half of African American dentists in all of the country. And it's interesting to note that dentists during this time almost to a man and to a woman for that matter, were civil rights leaders in their communities, particularly African-American dentists, because they were autonomous. They, uh, they didn't report to anybody. They had their own practice. A lot of times they had their own build. They could be community leaders and have, have a, a venue where, where communities could meet. And we have documented cases where some of these Ferris men were definitely in their, as dentists were involved in civil rights um, situations and cases within their community. Uh, one in particular was the, the Roanoke, um, uh, not, well, was the, uh, oh man, what was the group? Anyways, doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm trying to get through this, so bear with me. Here. Anyways, uh, I'll get back to Russell Dixon. Russell Dixon was, the, again, the Dean of Dentistry and, um, he was actually another thing that was interesting about him is he was um, he was taken in as a mentee by Mr. Ferris, um, a, a personal mentee. Mr. Ferris helped him get into Northwestern University um, and would, would bring him in, give him access to his uh, his private library of books and stuff. And so uh, Russell Dixon had a great relationship with Mr. Ferris and, and he, he considered him a, a mentor. Um, down here in, in the bottom left is Percival Prattis, which is, he's kind of one of my favorite guys. Uh, he was a, a journalist, um, and, and he was a, a voice of the African, Amer of, of African American people. I mean, he was, he was the executive editor of the Pittsburgh Courier and he had, he, he actually had this, um, this charge as he says in himself, you know, the chief function of the Negro newspaper along with other forces in, in Negro life, the fight for first class citizenship and full growth for Negroes. And that's what Percival Prattis and the African-American press did, is, is it, it provided the voice. It provided um, the pushback to any narratives that were coming out from the dominant society. The black press was 
was that fight, was that voice, was the thing that people turn to, to have a recourse to say, hey, this is not right. This is what's going on. Um, Percival Prattis was, he's got a, another connection after, um, after Ferris, he went to the war. After the war, he came to Grand Rapids and he helped start the Michigan State News, which was an NAACP newspaper um, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, he helped started that. He worked for the Associated Negro Press. He worked for the Chicago Defender. And then again, he, later on, he worked for the Pittsburgh Courier. One of his claims to fame is in 1947, he was elected to the press galleries of the United States uh, Senate and Congress, or yeah, House of Representatives and the Senate. And he actually had ear to the president as well. He was on the press galleries of the press corps. Where he, 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 he was able to interview um, the leaders of this country. He also, um, in 1925, he, he also developed a, a magazine called The Light and the Heebie Jeebies, which is a weird, a weird uh, title, but it was the first uh, news magazine of its kind, like the African American news magazine of its kind. And, and, if, and what I mean by news magazine is, is think of Ebony or Jet magazine. 20 years before Ebony started, uh, Percival Pratt has started that idea to, to do that news magazine. And, and the light and the heebie-jeebies ran for, I believe, five years. And so he was a pioneer in that as well. And, and what that did also is that that, that, that gave um, real life um, in, in newspapers and in magazines a real life description and depictions of African Americans and not as buffoons or as any, any, any other dominant culture stereotype, but it gave real imagery of what people do in the African-American community. Uh, the last guy here I'll talk about from the Hampton group is, um, is William Gibson. He was also an executive editor and he, he was for the Baltimore Afro-American, um, the, which was, I think the third most circulated, the Pittsburgh Curry was the first most circulated African-American newspaper during this time. And the Baltimore Afro-American was the third most circulated. Um, and he was the executive editor of that paper as well. Um, Gibson was, was started with as a sports writer, a sports editor. Um, and what's interesting about him is that uh, for the Baltimore Afro-American is that he, he started the coverage of the HBCU, the, the black college sports and for men and women. And so there was articles after articles and columns after column about the happenings from the college athletes at, at these HBCUs. And so this was the first of its kind to where that those sports were covered and, and, and those accomplishments were, were recognized. Uh, Gibson was a pioneer on that. Um, he, later on, he would become an editor of Ebony and Tan magazines, and he would... Um, yeah. Sorry, I, had, I thought I had something else to say about that, but I don't. Um, so let me go on here. Uh, I have a few, about 10 more minutes left. So um, getting back to the Ferris Institute. So after World War I, um, like I, we had read earlier, I read earlier about the, the African-American leaders said, we're willing to fight in this war if we can get the fruits of our labor. And, and that fruits is full citizenship. Well, obviously, after World War I, it, that was not the case. African American men came back from the war, and they were not given full citizenship. And you know, here they they fought for this country, and in particular, a lot of these men who fought um, in, with hell fighters and fought hell fighters and fought with groups that that were in tremendous battles, they weren't given citizenship. Well, this image here is, is a it's a real interesting image to me. Now, this is a 1921 or 1920 ROTC unit at the Ferris Institute. And so this is a few years after the war. Now, keep in mind, the United States military did not integrate to 1948. So here it is. This is 19, 1920. And if you see here, there's, there's African-American men all throughout here that are, that are part of this ROTC unit. And this ROTC unit wasn't necessarily as ROTC units are today where they're training officers. These were actually veterans. These guys fought in the war. And, and they were they were veterans. Some of them were officers. And for instance, this man down here, um, Leonard McLeod, was an officer um, in the United States military. He was actually one of the first African American officers in the military at the where he was trained at Fort Des Moines in Iowa. And after he he got was an officer after the war, he came to Ferris to 
pursue his education. And so, I mean, this the, Ferris was a place that that offered this opportunity. But it's also interesting because this is not just the, the one image. There's many images that we have of these ROTC units at this time that are integrated. Now, to me, that just shows the Institute and Mr. Ferris making a bold and unapologetic statement of this is who we are and this is how this country should be. All these men served and all these men should be recognized and given the dignity and respect that they earned for for their sacrifice and their their duties in the war. So I really, I've always liked this picture. I, I, I hope sometime, someday we can have it put up somewhere on the campus. Again, Mr. Ferris was all about equal opportunity. There's another quote. Um, his whole thing was to awake people to real brotherhood and to where everyone had an equal opportunity and no special privilege. And I think Mr. Ferris demonstrated that with how he lived his life and how he how he ran his school and provided this opportunity for for people. Um, another thing I want to talk about real quick is the that Mr. Ferris did while he was governor and he was at the time he was governor of Michigan he was still uh, the president of the Ferris Institute is that gov as governor he appointed members and delegates to study the progress and accomplishments of African Americans 50 years after emancipation and now all this was in was in buildup for the Lincoln Jubilee, which is which was in Chicago, Illinois, in 1915. Um, as governor, he 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 made sure that he was going to do state monies to to do this study, and so because it's important, Mr. Ferris, as the governor, felt and knew that this was important to study and to highlight the accomplishments of African Americans in not just in Michigan, but throughout all the country. Um, and this is an image from the Lincoln Jubilee in 1915. This is the Michigan, one of the Michigan segments, sections. And again, you can see, not again, but here is Elijah McCoy and he's got some uh, items of his inventions. Uh, you have Michigan farm producers and, and they just, there's a bunch of highlights of the amazing accomplishments, not amazing, but they were amazing, but just the great accomplishments of, of people at this time, um, and it was highlighted here at the Lincoln Jubilee. Um, there's a quote that Mr. Ferris has that, that is well known. It says, the Ferris Institute is one of the most democratic schools in the United States. There's no color line, there's no age limit, it's educational requirements for admission, or has no education requirements for admission. It is open every man, every woman, boy and girl who are hungry for an education. Now, this is a good quote and it's a nice quote and you know it's all bubbles and and candy canes and stuff but what this came out of was after mr ferris gave a speech and he spoke about an incident at the ferris institute so he gave the speech at this uh three minutes progress or he gave the speech at the lincoln jubilee on the michigan day and he talked about that there was an african-american student a girl a woman who was at the ferris institute and she was in a boarding house because there were no dorms at the time well, when the boarding mother and the other girls realized that she was African-American, they wanted her out of there. Well, the first thing that, that Mr. Ferris did was find her a new place to stay. Um, but the very next day at the morning exercises, he, for lack of a better term, uh, chastised the women or the girls and the whole cam the campus and said, you know, I thought we were living in Michigan and not Mississippi. And in this institute, that's not who we are, basically. That that we are not that place. We are the place that that does provide opportunity. We are a place who values people at, of of all color, all race, men, women, and everything. And then this quote comes out of that is what he says to to his um to his institute to his people. Now it took a lot for him to humble himself and to um, tell this story publicly. I mean, to to, to tell it. But it also speaks of the Institute and, and, and of the place that, that he founded because this is his life's work and this is what he wanted it to be. And he knew that it was right or he knew that it wasn't right to treat people this way. And he wanted to make sure that he addressed it. Um, I talked earlier about Mr. Ferris providing uh, loans to students, but he also provided housing. Uh, there's a picture here on right across from this is the Stewart Oak, which is right across from the alumni building. There used to be a, a house there. Um, that's where a, a house was that Mr. Ferris bought and uh, provided for the African American for some African American students that came from Hampton to stay in, so that they could they could focus on their education and not have to worry about you know living living in, in other homes where where house mothers and 
and people boarding houses didn't like them because they were black. So he he basically started the first dorms on campus. And, and there was another house that a lot of students stayed at on Locust Street. I'm not sure if Mr. Ferris bought that one too, but um, there was at least two houses that that were associated with the university or the institute that Mr. Ferris uh, provided housing for these students. Um, here's a quote in 1939 from Baltimore Afro-American, and it talks about Mr. Ferris as in regard to Vandenberg, who, who was the governor who took over after Mr. Ferris. But it says that, uh, you know, Senator Ferris is best remembered for his affiliation with the Ferris Institute, which was most liberal to colored students. So even 11 years after his death, uh, the, the African-American press still remembered how this institute was and, and the impact that it had. Um, a couple here uh, words from some of these students, these some students from Hampton that came to Ferris I thought was interesting. Um, this guy, Paul Maurice Floyd, says, to quote Mr. Ferris, some people look forward to attending college with the idea that college is a place where they can secure the means of a living or living a life of ease. He said, but they should have the aim of helping humanity to live better, regardless of dollars and cents to be had for compensation. So again, he, he tried to instill this message on make the world better in and everywhere you're at, anytime you can. Uh, here's Belford Lawson. While he was at Ferris, he wrote a letter back to Hampton University where he decided at Ferris that he wanted to, to take law. And the reason why he wanted to take law is because he felt that he would be of service in the world in that capacity. So again, to serve the world, uh, Belford Lawson at Ferris was inspired then to become a, an attorney. And we talked about some of his accomplishments. Um, I don't want to lose sight of, of Garrett Maslink, who was Mr. Ferris' second person in, in, or vice president. Mr. Maslink was a was was just as loved as Mr. Ferris, and um, you know he he would write to the registrar of Hampton, and almost to a man, every time he wrote, kind of give an update, he would say something about the person, and not just you know it, he focused on an individual, and you could tell that he knew these people, all his students, and he had a relationship with his students. I'm running out of time here, but um, there's other stories. Mr. Ferris exposed the students to a world of diversity. You have N.C. Hanks, who was a guy who came to Ferris on multiple occasions. Um, he lost his eyes and his hands in a mining accident, um, but he was a poet and he was a writer. And Mr. Ferris wanted to expose his students to 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 his story and to this life of of challenge, but not necessarily challenge, but not not of disability, but ability. Um, I talked about Booker T. Washington earlier, but also Mr. Ferris brought a woman, uh, Frances Preston, uh, elocutionist and organizer and lecturer, um, and oops, I'm running out of time, to Ferris as well. Uh, he brought a lot of people to expose the students to that. Um, I was going to talk about 1969, where um, I think Ferris lost its way. Um, you know, we talked about all this kind of this these good things that the Ferris Institute was was happening, was going on. But in 1969 and, and again in the late 80s, I think you know, Ferris lost its way. There was racial incidents on campus um, where you had faculty, staff, and students chanting racial slurs to, to students, African-American students in the dorms. And, um, you know, we... We lost our way, and, and I think it's. I think we need to get back to that, and we need to to find a way to get back to to the the, the trajectory that Mr. Ferris wanted to put us on. Um, I, four things I want to say. I think we have a history to be proud of at the Ferris Institute. There's a legacy of diversity, equity, and inclusion that we need to live up to. I think we need to help others rise anytime we can, and then also ask ourselves, how can I make the world better? In my circle of influence. So I'm going to stop here. I do have a little bit more to go, but I'm going to stop here because I'm on time. So. Awesome. Thank you. We do have some questions and some comments that came in. So if you bear with me real quick, um, first of all, you mentioned Belford was an alpha. Not everyone might know what that means. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. Yeah. So uh, Alpha was Alpha 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 Phi Alpha fraternity. Um, it was one of the the the, the first African American fraternities in, in the United States. Um, almost every other white fraternity would not allow African Americans to join. So Alphas were one of the first ones that that started. Um, they were a civil rights group. I mean, they started to be. Uh, uh, civil rights types of groups, I mean, like the NAACP, that's what the alphas in a lot of these fraternities were, were, were the civil rights arms on campuses. Um, 
they 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 would raise money to to provide attorneys to to help cases, you know, civil rights things all throughout the country. And so that that's who the alphas are. Okay. Um, higher education must have been set up much differently during Mr. Ferris and Booker T. Washington's time. Was Ferris drastically different during that time for having such open policies? I think they were. Um, well, they, they definitely were. They were different than than most um, predominantly white institutions because uh, a lot of these African American students didn't have the opportunity to go to to. So let me let me try to do it this way. So all right, the reason why a lot of students from Hampton came to Ferris, because Hampton per, per focused on uh, practical education, so hands on. And, and there was not a lot of um, science and arts and, and things that curriculums that could get you into another college or university. Well, Ferris provided that they provided that, that ability to to take um, college preparatory program or business programs, which then would allow a person to transfer to the University of Michigan or to Northwestern or to, you know, uh, uh, another you know, Michigan Agricultural College to, to a bigger school. So Ferris provided, um, I wanted, they were kind of like a junior college, but they were more than a junior college because they provided, um, they, pro they did provide college level courses as well, but they also provided that interim stuff that could get you from where you're at to a university. Okay. Uh, we have a nice comment here. Thank you for the presentation, Franklin. And thank you and Dr. Pilgrim for the great work on the book. Uh, it's an excellent read. I was Good. wondering if you could take a bit and talk about the process and how the book really came about. Oh, man. So, um, <laughs> So it was funny. So uh, Dr. Pilgrim asked me to try to find some images of Gideon Smith because uh, one of the things for the strategic plan um, and the diversity office uh, diversity plan was to, to 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 change some of the art to have some more diverse art on campus. And so he wanted to get like a, a painting or a sculpture of Gideon Smith. And so I was looking at your books and trying to find some some better images of Gideon and and I was flipping through some and I would see it's like all right, he's not the only black guy here. <laughs> I was like, there's a couple other people. So, and then as the yearbooks would, would go further, some of the yearbooks would have where people are from. And so I was noticing, I was like, man, some of these, these African-American students here are from, you know, Virginia or Washington, D.C. They all seem to be from the area where Hampton, Hampton uh, University, Hampton Institute at the time was, and they're in uh, Virginia, Hampton, Virginia. And so a lot of these students seem to be from there. So I started looking at the Southern Workmen, which was the Hamptons yearbook or their Hamptons register kind of book. And and I was matching these students up. And the man, these students went to Ferris and they went to Hampton. Went to Ferris, went to Hampton. And so we just we realized that the story was bigger. And then once we started finding, okay, well, we, we see these students were here. Well, did they do anything after they graduated. And once we like we found Belford Lawson and Percival Prattis, and we knew right then and there that this was this was a bigger story. Um, and, and and I got to give a shout out to Fran Rosen, um, a librarian at Ferris. She she was helping us do some research and she's the one who who found the news article about Booker T. Washington being here in 1902. And so as we start finding this information, we're like, man, nobody, we're looking through some of the Ferris books that we had and like, we're like, no one knows this stuff. <laughs> you know, we're like, this is a big story. This is, this changes the history of, of this Institute. And, and, and it's at, and then at that time too, you had a lot of places like Yale and Harvard who are, who are taking statues and stuff down of their founders and the people who were there early because they were, they, they, they weren't necessarily good people. Um, but the Ferris Institute, Mr. Ferris, we were like, man, this is a good story. This is something that we need to do. You know, we need to. So we just kind of kept researching, um, reading. Uh, I went down to Hampton and did some research at their archives down in Hampton, Virginia. Um, again, I want to thank Dr. Pilgrim and Dr. Eisler. I mean, we, we presented to the President's Council and showed them some of this stuff. And, and Dr. Eisler would get excited and he would like, keep doing, keep going, keep going. So he and I think he was the first one who said this needs to be a book. And so we're like, OK, let's do it. What's next? Is there another <laughs> book? Is there another book looming out there? Well, um, one of the things that uh, that 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 
I think that we can do that, that came out of some of this the study was um, um, the Ferris Notable Alumni Display, which is yes. in the University Center. There's uh, there's a lot of people that we found that we discovered um, that, that that need to be highlighted, and there's a lot of stories of, of people who it really impacted the world in 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 tremendous ways that came through the Ferris Institute. And so we have a group of that, that from the from the Ferris Institute that are already on display. We have a little website for them as well. Um, but we want to do that for the college and for the university and, and expand that and, and expand our, our our alumni base and, and celebrate these stories and celebrate these accomplishments because man, I'll put Ferris's uh, alumni up against anybody. I mean, we have some of the best alumni in, in all the country and, and, and we haven't, we haven't uh, cultivated that. And, and I think we need to be more proud of that and, and, and promote that because people from the first college and from Ferris university, first university and the Institute have done tremendous things. And again, I'll put us up against anybody. We actually had an alum reach out to us um, who was a student, had been a student, but back in 1963 had actually walked with Martin Luther King Jr. and um, was thrown in jail with him and 30 others. But he was able to listen to him preach and, and talk about the message of peace and civil rights. So there are so many stories. There are so many alums that have more messages to share. And I, and I think that's evident. Um, just a little bit about the Jim Crow Museum, if you could share with some of those that are listening. They may not know what's what's in store for Jim Crow. Yeah, so we're we're um, we're in the process of trying to trying to raise some money. So if anybody's got a you know a couple million dollars that they want to give, as Dr. Pergram says, <laughs> you know, no donation is too large. Um, mm -hmm. But we're we're trying to build a, a, a new standalone facility. Um, for the Jim Crow Museum, we have now over twenty thousand uh, objects and pieces, and, and we want to we want to be good stewards of what people have given us, and and to to present present the items um, in, in in a cultivated manner to, to to where people can actually get something from it, and and we want to have this facility where there's there's better archives, better storage. Um, conference rooms, areas that, that we can have these discussions, have discussions of race and race relations and, and, and what do we do and how do we make the world better? I mean, we're struggling with that in a sense, but but we need to figure that out. How Mr. Ferris inspired people to do that and they did it. So how do we inspire people and, and get people to make the world better um, and, and, and have hard discussions and have tough discussions because th there's, there's a lot of racial scabs and wounds that aren't necessarily spoken about. And, and I think a lot of times, as Dr. King said, in order to, to, to get it, you have to, a boil, you boil, you have to get through all that nasty stuff in order for it to heal. And, and, and I think that's a, a way for us to heal um, with the new facility. Um, it's going to be, you know, hopefully if it once it built, they're prominent on the Ferris campus. Um, I think one of the first things you see when you come in and uh, yeah. So, I'm not trying. I think we have some more information on our website, on the Ferris website, that that has some information about the expansion project. Great. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Franklin. I appreciate you taking the time to chat this evening uh, and share an important part of history with all of us. I think the value of diversity and opportunity are clearly evident as to Mr. Ferris's influence. So, thank you again for spending the hour with us. Brandy, you might be muted on accident, Brandy. I can't hear you. Uh oh. Unless I'm... Oh. <laughs> oh. Okay. I think, I think we're good. I That's can't good. hear it then. So. <laughs> so I was giving you a thumbs up. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder, if you missed any part of the presentation or would like to go back and review a section, um, this webinar can be found beginning tomorrow on this website under past events or on our Facebook page at Ferris Alumni. Also, the Office of Multicultural Student Services and the Center for Student Involvement continue celebrating Martin Luther King Jr. next week on campus. Their celebration includes the annual Dr. MLK Jr. March on Monday, as well as a virtual event that you are all invited to attend.
If your calendar permits, we hope you can join us Monday, January 17th from 5 to 6 p.m. for Living Legends Advocacy in Action, which is a live conversation uh, with Joan Trumpauer Mulholland, a civil rights icon and freedom writer. You can watch via Zoom by using um, the personal link that we will share with you at the bottom of the screen. And also, I'm sorry, we'll post in the comment section as well. So again, thank you everybody for um, sharing an hour with us. And we're very proud of our alums and all they have to offer. And a special thank you to Franklin for today for bringing this important subject to matter. So thank you and have a great evening.